I've known Dan now for about four years. We met at Ashgrove Baptist, um, where we had our preaching conference just a week and a half ago. A, a lot of you were there at the, the conference, which was great. Personally, Dan is a, a man of authenticity and integrity like not many others. Um, when he speaks, he speaks clearly, communicates really well. Um, but you know that you are getting the real Dan whenever you talk to Dan. He's just authentic. He says it like it is, and he doesn't pretend. And I love that about him. Um, and it's, it really is an, an honor to have you here tonight, Dan. There are some beliefs that we hold, aren't there, that we sometimes think, where did this come from? We can hold the, those beliefs really firmly. Uh, someone might say to us, why do you believe what you believe about hell or what, heaven? And we say, I don't know, but I'm going to die on this hill, <laughs> you know? And sometimes it's worth asking ourselves where it came from, because I think there are a bunch of beliefs that we sort of get from Sunday school or the way that we're brought up. And there comes a time in our lives where it really is worth asking ourselves, can we rethink some of the things we were taught as kids? Because some of those beliefs, it's not that they go out of fashion or anything like that, but when you're conditioned with certain ways of thinking as a young person, there is a time to come back and say, hmm, is it worth revisiting? Is it worth asking myself, asking those around me what they think about this or whether I'm just carrying this belief through, through my whole life? Now, some of you might be here tonight because that's the case for you. Um, one of the things that's really good about this approach to sharing about hell tonight is that it's a personal testimony. Dan isn't here to debate with anyone. He's not here to argue with you or anyone else or to tell you that his view is right, I don't think, and that everyone else is wrong. Um, the great thing about a personal testimony that moves from a belief in X to a belief in Y is that we can learn about the process, the emotion, the social uh, implications of changing one's theological position. And that's really important. And I'm really keen to hear what Dan has to say about all of that. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Dan Patterson. Would you make him welcome? Well, a huge thank you to Paul Jones and all the faculty here at Trinity. I'm delighted to be able to come, uh, maybe not share on this topic, but I'm delighted to be able to be here. There are certain kinds of subjects that you feel relatively in the hot seat, and this is certainly one of them. But maybe a little bit about me. Uh, I have been married for 10 years. Uh, if you want to know about conscious suffering, my wife is definitely the one to speak to. She's been enduring my bad humor for a long time. I often say that being married to me is like experiencing eternal punishment. Uh, and that's about as good as it's gonna to get tonight. The humor is not getting any better, I promise. Uh, we've got three young boys, uh, Josiah and Zach and Seth. And so I haven't slept in a really long time, which means if anything I say tonight actually makes sense, then uh, a miracle has been done in your presence. And if you're not already convinced of the existence of God, then now is a good time to start believing. But how about we dive into tonight's topic? What I believe today at 34 would shock my 24-year-old self. As I was coming to the close of my own master's degree back in 2011, I decided to undergo a thesis, a major research project studying the doctrine of hell. Now, before you worry, I have been psychologically assessed and I have a report to prove that I am of clear uh, uh, mental health. So you're probably wondering what on earth would make me want to do a deep dive to study hell. Well, the major trigger back then in my decision was the release of an infamous book now by Rob Bell, the book Love Wins, the one that was posing questions about universalism. And this book set off a firestorm of controversy. And on the day it was released, Rob Bell found himself officially cancelled among theological conservatives by the reformed evangelical equivalent of a papal bull. It was a single tweet from John Piper that read, farewell, Rob Bell. Now, those fraught dynamics were my introduction to the hell debate in evangelical circles. As a relatively young Christian at the time studying for ministry, I had a deep desire to please Christ, to serve the church, and to advance the gospel. So 
So I felt compelled at the time to join the fray and to defend historical orthodoxy in the face of the perceived theological decay. Now, I'd always heard preached that as tragic as it sounds, as much as it breaks God's heart, that the Bible undeniably taught that those who end up in hell after the general resurrection and final judgment would consciously experience God's wrath for all eternity in a body that cannot die. It was said to me many times, everyone lives forever, either in heaven or in hell. And as a budding public Christian, one who wanted to commend Christ to an unbelieving world, I knew that hell was a barrier for secular people and post-Christian people. In every public Q&A, I faced down the same tough question. How could a loving God send people to hell? I also knew, though, that people's beliefs about hell, their imaginations concerning what hell might be like, were rarely informed by the Bible itself, nor by orthodox theology. For thousands of years, the afterlife, and hell in particular, has been a muse for all kinds of fantastical and fearful artistic depictions. Take Dante's Inferno, for instance, the installment, the first one of the Divine Comedy trilogy, where he fabricated the nine circles of gruesome detail as you descend further and further into hell. Or take Milton's Paradise Lost, where in the capital city of hell, Lucifer consoles his fellow fallen angels after their damnation with a warped justification. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. A line that has spawned the popular misguided belief that Satan presides over the dark underworld as a sadistic ruler. Now, books like these have given rise to an entire genre of ghastly paintings and sculptures that have shaped our thinking about hell. And from high art to lower forms of our modern entertainment culture, mainstay movies and the popular animations like The Simpsons and South Park have filled our conscious imagination with dem demons and devils with torments and terrors, and a whole slew of thoughts that stray so far from the scriptures. So I set out as a young student to meet these various challenges head on by tearing down ridiculous caricatures and clearing up misconceptions, and ultimately by retelling the Christian story in a way that marries together God's love and holiness in how he deals with evil. I sought myself to restore the heart to the traditionalist account of hell to defend biblical teaching of hell as eternal conscious torment, and to defend and vindicate God against the charge of being cruel and unjust in his judgments. That was the scope of my thesis. Any good oversayer would say that I bit off more than I could chew. But the research phase of my project took place while I was studying another course in Oxford. There, whatever spare time I had between my classes and papers was spent in libraries poring over books and articles from historical and contemporary theology about hell, as well as commentaries on all of the major verses. For those of you who are allergic to reading, this experience would have felt like its own kind of purgatory, but at least the scenery of Oxford spires made up for the laborious study. Kind of was like studying hell as a character in a Harry Potter movie. Now, the first chapter of my thesis was simply an historical taxonomy. It was there that I tried to outline the three broad views that early Christian fathers, as well as Christians all throughout history, have held concerning hell. Traditionalism, conditionalism, and universalism. Now, for those of you who are new to the theological conversation around hell, let me quickly parse out a little about those views. Traditionalism, so named for being the historically dominant view ever since Augustine of Hippo, this view holds that in hell, you experience eternal conscious torment, physically or psychologically, in a body that cannot die. Conditionalism, better known as conditional immortality, holds that only the saved are granted everlasting life and immortality through the gospel as a gift, and that those who are lost are thrown into hell and eventually succumb to the second death, an eternal capital punishment where the body and soul are irreversibly destroyed. And universalism, sometimes known as universal reconciliation, it holds that the punishment of hell, it's not retributive against sin, but that it's remedial for the sinner, leading to a person's repentance and then their translation out of hell and into the presence of God in the new heavens and the new earth. All three views actually agree that hell exists, but on traditionalism, the fire torments, on conditionalism, the fire consumes, and on universalism, the fire refines. Now, heading into this project, I was convinced that the Bible taught the traditional view. 
And with this conviction, it wasn't hard to learn enough about these other two views simply to refute their shadow. Using Bible verses about eternal fire and undying worms as a cudgel against opposing arguments. There was, though, one thing I found in my research that was perplexing. I discovered that there were a number of high profile evangelical Anglicans and Baptists, mostly and largely from the UK, who held to the view of conditional immortality. Richard Borkham, David Instone Brewer, Michael Green, John Wenham, John Stackhouse Jr., E. Earl Ellis, R.T. France, I. Howard Marshall. Anthony Thistleton, to name a few. Even John Stott, one of my heroes of the faith who co-founded the Lausanne movement with Billy Graham and healthily shepherded evangelicalism in England. He came out in defense of conditional immortality in the late 1980s at great cost to his global ministry and to his reputation as an evangelical statesman. Now, I didn't know what to do with this information at the time. I figured that these guys, brilliant as they were in so many other areas, had just gone soft on the doctrine of hell. I wasn't nearly convinced by my cursory glance of their arguments that there was any biblical alternative to the traditional view. And so in the end, after my research, I went on to do my best to defend a sort of C.S. Lewis approach to final perdition, where the gates of hell are locked, not from the outside, but from the inside, from our own unwillingness to repent and to let go of our evil, rather than from any shortcoming in the love of God or in his universal salvific desire. Now, honestly, looking back now, I actually think my defense of the traditional view is about as strong as any of the others I've ever read. I completed that project steeled in my historically orthodox convictions, and I went on shortly after to join an international team of evangelists and apologists, where I was given the unfortunate title of being the hell guy. Whenever the hell question came up on a Q&A panel, everyone happily panned and turned to me, glad to have themselves escaped the fire and they could watch me sweat in that hot seat. So our question tonight, why did I change my mind about hell? How does someone who wrote their master's thesis and spent their public ministry defending one view end up changing their mind? Now, my goal tonight is not so much to make a case for conditional immortality, the view that I now hold with an open hand. Rather, what I want to do is use my own experience as something of a case study for developing a theological conscience on any controversial Christian doctrine, with the goal that we learn together how to hold our beliefs in a way that honors Christ, that serves the church, and that advances the gospel. So, How do we do that? Well, I recently read a brilliant book by Gavin Ortland on the necessity of engaging in what he calls the theological triage. And the book is aptly named, Finding the Right Hills to Die On. The whole book is about how and when we need to draw theological boundaries, whether personally in our own lives or together as churches and Christian institutions. When, if ever, is it appropriate to tweet farewell when someone from your tribe changes their mind on a particular doctrine? Now, one of Gavin's central theses is that we need a healthy grid to be able to make these kinds of decisions, alongside a charity and godliness of spirit in how to enact them. And so after surveying in his book a couple of existing options for such a grid, he simply put down four key questions that we should all ask whenever we are weighing the truth of any Christian doctrine. History, scripture, theology, and culture. Number one, history. What has the church always believed throughout history? Number two, scripture. How clear is the Bible's teaching on this doctrine? Number three, theology. What effect does this doctrine have on the gospel? And number four, culture. What effect does this doctrine have on the church? Now, tonight I'm actually going to use these four questions as my grid for talking about why I changed my mind about hell. And hopefully, along the way, you might pick up some helpful pointers for shaping your own theological conscience on controversial subjects. And especially, on how to hold those opinions in a way that is healthy for you and helpful for others. So let me launch off with the first question. History. What does the church believe about hell throughout history? Now, this is an interesting place to start, especially since, in case you didn't know already, I'm not really a Roman Catholic. I do not believe that church tradition is itself an authoritative source to which we should submit. But still, even the rebellious Baptist committed to sola scriptura, foolish to think that there are no deep wells of wisdom dug by the church. 
along with some well-worn paths to serve as a guide for avoiding serious theological error. My basic take is this, that if you think you have discovered something novel, something that the majority of the church has missed for centuries, including its brightest minds and godliest pastors, can I humbly suggest you're probably wrong. As a rule, like Jesus' warning about specks and planks, our first impulse should be a healthy dose of self-doubt, assuming something is blinding us more than everyone else. Now, wisdom dictates that we remain in the safe harbor of historical orthodoxy before ever recklessly setting course on some self-assured theological adventure. At least, we should stay there as long as we can, until we feel like we have no option but to depart, having soberly weighed the cost, the potential of that cost for us and for others if we're wrong. That, to me, is the value of this historical question, the value of church tradition that the great cloud of witnesses serve to us as a guide and a help to shelter us from error. So what has the church believed about hell throughout history? Well, the reality is that traditional view really is a good name for it. Ever since Augustine of Hippo at the close of the fourth century, some version of eternal conscious torment has been the overwhelmingly dominant view across all three historic branches of the church, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and Protestantism. That being said, what passes for traditionalism today is radically different to what Jonathan Edwards believed back in the 1700s, or John Calvin two centuries before, or Anselm four centuries before, or Augustine six centuries before. Their focus was primarily on the physical torments of hell, of fire literally burning ever regenerating flesh in an immortal body. Pretty gruesome stuff. Today, the vast majority of traditionalist scholars, they tend to find this view apart, opting instead for the separationist view, where the torments of hell stem primarily from being deprived of the good of God's presence, or a dehumanization view, where we move away from the horizon of our true humanity, the more sin curves us inwards. Interestingly, though, none of the early creeds hashed out by the church fathers took a position on hell. And none of the seven ecumenical councils condemned conditional immortality as a heresy, whereas it does seem to have condemned Oregon's version of universalism, the apocatastasis doctrine, at the Third Council of Constantinople in 583. It was anathematized. But historically speaking, conditional immortality, if we're honest, has definitely been the minority report, even if you can trace a stream of faithful adherence all the way back to the second generation of the early church with what is known as the apostolic fathers. Now, that theological charity, though, in the early church is not something that you'll find much of today. There are a few notable exceptions. The Lausanne movement, which we mentioned already with their Lausanne covenant as the guiding document, actually paved a way for traditionalists and conditionalists alike to be bound together in a common gospel mission, to seek and to save those who would otherwise be eternally lost. But these exceptions, they are far from the norm. In many evangelical circles, particularly in North America, adherence to the traditional view on hell has become something of a theological litmus test for determining whether you are truly an evangelical. If you deny this doctrine, you are suspected to have come to an agenda that is eroding the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Within the circle, simply signing up to the biblical language of eternal punishment or eternal fire or eternal destruction, that's not enough. You have to affirm a traditionalist interpretation of that language in favor of eternal conscious torment. In other words, while doing theological triage, large numbers have identified conditionalism as a dangerous cancer and set up a boundary that excludes conditionalists from fellowship. Now, there's actually nothing sinister going on here. These traditionalist theologian pastors are hardly trying to do harm. The opposite is true. They seek to uphold the Bible's teaching against perceived cultural pressure to bow down. And I end them for that attitude, the desire to guard the gospel as it had been entrusted to us by generations of faithful stalwarts. But because of this environment I just described, my own journey towards embracing conditional immortality, it happened in secret. It happened over a number of years and mostly unknown to even good ministry friends around me. I had no desire to court controversy. I had no desire to distract others from good gospel work. 
So while I was questioning the particulars of hell in the background, I just committed to publicly presenting a mere orthodoxy on the subject, doing what was necessary to help people reconcile the logic of hell, that a loving God must step in to restore justice through judgment and cosmically exile unrepentant evildoers in order to safeguard the good of the new creation. Now, this was not a deconstruction of my faith by any means. My foundations have never been as solid. But as I'll explain in the next section, I simply came across some reasons to scrutinize my traditionalist convictions. Now, a number of years ago, while in Oxford doing this research phase, I received some incredibly wise advice by my theology professor, Benno van den Torren. He said that whenever you come across a controversial doctrine in scripture, one where intelligent and godly Christians disagree, you need to fight the temptation to draw hasty conclusions. You should take a few years, he suggested seven, maybe for biblical reasons, where you resist taking a side just to be numbered amongst your theological heroes, and instead devote yourself to truly hearing out the biblical arguments from all sides, steel manning each position to read the scripture through their eyes, and all the while praying that God would develop in you a faithful theological conscience. Isn't that good advice? You know, as an aside, this is actually the substance of John Stuart Mill's case for free speech in his classic On Liberty. He argued that in order to know whether what we believe truly is the superior view, and even develop the wisdom and critical thinking enabling us to make such a judgment, we need to expose ourselves to the best arguments for a competing view, rather than simply shut it down. Cancel culture doesn't work. Bad ideas need to be combated in the light of reason, not simply suppressed. Because only when our own arguments have been scrutinized and rise to the occasion can we be confident that they are truly worth believing. In other words, truth invites questioning. Now, I genuinely wish I could have been more open about my journey at the time. A theology is always best done in community, where in conversation scriptures and with others, your weak spots are challenged and your blind spots exposed. But in my case, because of my public ministry and the strong reaction in some quarters to questioning the traditional view, I knew I had to be discreet. As it turns out, after a few years of rethinking hell, with the end result of coming to believe that the Bible taught conditional immortality, my change of mind came at a cost. When the leadership of the ministry I was working for learned that I had privately changed my beliefs about hell, that triggered a series of unforeseen events. And even though I'd been a trusted voice in the subject, the hell guy, and even though I had promised to keep my view private, and even though I was well-loved by those in leadership on a personal level, I was still asked to either sign up to a new doctrinal statement explicitly affirming eternal conscious torment or to stand down for reasons of personal conscience. Now, I'm, I'm something of a feeler as well as a thinker, and that was a heavy ultimatum to face. I spent a few months actually trying to argue myself out of my new theological footing, reading every critique I could get my hand on trying to disprove conditional immortality. I even sought out wisdom and counsel from local and international theologians, with one of them more pragmatically minded, just telling me to damn my conscience and sign the document in order to save my job and look after my family. But in the end, I just couldn't go back. In the words of Martin Luther, to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. And there comes a time when having done your due diligence and exploring the arguments from all sides, you need to be willing to pay the cost if you believe the church has got it wrong. If you believe historical orthodoxy might in fact be biblical heterodoxy. After all, the church has been wrong before. The protest in Protestant stands for something. And so with a heavy heart, I stepped down from a ministry I loved and away from a team of some of my closest friends. And that was a tough season. I never stood apart from historical orthodoxy before. And whilst I considered myself to be sheltering in the safer harbor of God's word, it didn't remove the sting. It doesn't make it easier to feel diminished as a trusted voice in the sight of people you admire. But I knew how I handled this situation would be a defining moment for my faith. So given the fraught climate within evangelicalism, my earnest desire not to stoke the fires of controversy against a ministry that I loved. I was careful, I was cryptic, to not let anyone know what had happened. 
there was a sense of self-preservation mixed in there too, if we're honest. I didn't want to get canceled or to be pigeonholed as the hell guy for an entirely new reason. But mostly, at the time, I was simply unconvinced that it was right to go public about my change of mind around town. Just because something cost me something personally is no good reason to spark a public conversation. Not unless you are sure that it's in the interest of serving the church and advancing the gospel. That's the shorthand story of how I changed my mind on historical orthodoxy. But for the why I changed my mind about hell, we're going to need to go back a little bit and ask the second question in our grid. Scripture. How clear is the Bible's teaching about hell? Now, for any student of theology, the Bible should always be the starting point. The only reason you should ever have for changing your mind on any Christian doctrine is because you've become convinced that this is, in fact, properly understood what the Bible teaches. I still believe in the Scriptures. I believe finally inspired when he wrote to Timothy, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. For now, you're just going to have to settle with this as an assertion rather than me offering an argument, because we're going to have to save the topic of why I believe the Bible is a book from God for another Trinity unplugged. <laughs> but suffice to say, the Bible is why I changed my mind about hell. I often hear in the ongoing hell debate that conditionalists have ulterior motives for their position, that they're the business of air conditioning hell, to borrow L. Moller's phrase that they simply cannot stomach the thought of people suffering in hell for all eternity. Now, if you Google John Stott on this subject, for instance, you will find dozens of blogs and articles that pull a quote from him to this effect. Regarding eternal conscious torment, Stott wrote, emotionally, I find the concept intolerable and do not understand how to deal with it without either cauterizing their feelings or cracking under the strain. Now, it may be true that some conditionalists come to their beliefs as a knee-jerk reaction against the traditional view of hell, driven more by moral intuitions than by scripture. But that is not Stott's position. Take a look at the very next two sentences after the previous quote, this which was selectively truncated to deceive, achieve the desired effect. Because Stott continues, but our emotions are a fluctuating, unreliable guide to truth and must not be exalted to the place of supreme authority in determining it. As a committed evangelical, my question must be and is not what does my heart tell me, but what does God's word say? You know, Stott is hardly some evangelifish on the topic as some traditionalists want to paint him to be. And the moment I started talking to evangelical conditionalists, this smear tactic, impugning someone's motive so you can ignore their arguments, it just began to ring hollow. In 2016, after some very public Q&As on hell that I'd done for the ministry, went online by YouTube, a friend contacted me. He would read my thesis, it was out there in the ether, and he had some probing questions, ones that he asked very courteously. Tone matters when you really want to talk. And his objections intrigued me. And so I started joining online conversations and reading up-to-date scholarship on conditional immortality. I chose to dive deeper into how they interacted with scripture than I'd previously done in when I did my project. Now, for years as a young pastor, I had made it my habit to have the church where I preached write Acts 17.11 at the top of their notepads whenever I was giving a sermon. Why? Because Acts 17.11 is where Luke, the author of the book of Acts, commends the Berean Jews as more noble than the Thessalonican Jews. Because not only did they receive Paul's message with all readiness of heart, they then went to diligently test his teaching by filtering it by, through what they knew to be the only bedrock for theological truth, the Bible. And years later now, I found myself presented with my own challenge. Was I willing to put my beliefs about hell to the test of scripture, being scrutinized by a worthy representatives of conditional immortality, or would I simply back away? Now, no doubt, as a young guy at the time, the competitive side in me probably kicked in. So I decided to take up that conversation with conditional immortality. I committed within myself to listen deeply to the other side and trying to read scripture through their eyes. But secretly, I was pretty convinced and hoping that ultimately I would emerge with my arguments vindicated. And so we turn to scripture. What did people say about hell? 
Well, the first thing I learned is that this is actually the wrong question to ask. Sometimes the first step in any investigation is to make sure you're asking the right questions. For the right answers to the wrong questions still lead to faulty conclusions. Diving into scripture, only asking what does it say about hell is like going to the doctor to get your blood results and only asking if you have cancer. The problem, it narrows the investigative scope and it ignores other relevant questions. Because previously I'd gone to the Bible with this narrow question, looking for evidence of what is called hell or of eternal conscious torment, I ended up ignoring so much about what the Bible did say about God's judgment for sin. For instance, because the Old Testament never mentions hell, nor eternal conscious torment, my thesis summary of the entire Jewish Bible opened with the line, the doctrine of hell is conspicuously absent from the Old Testament. But the Old Testament is far from silent about God's judgment. And so I reframe my question. What does the Bible teach about the final fate of the lost? And that is when I, all of a sudden I was flooded with new biblical data. You see, from the opening scene of Genesis, God's warning about the wages is consistent. Adam and Eve were the first to taste this bitter reality. After sinning against God in Eden, they were exiled from the garden. Why? Well, the text says it plainly. So that they could not, in their sinful state, reach out and eat of the life-giving fruit that would grant them bodily immortality for an ever enabling them to corrupt God's good world. Instead, as their sentence, they were cast out of the paradise of God's presence. Where separated from the love and the light and the life of God, they became subject to the wild world beyond eat, to disorder, to darkness, even to death. The penalty for their sin was death. Now, what is fascinating in this story, for those of you who are wondering, immediately struck down is, not only like us, does God graciously give us time in order to lead us to repentance, but if you read carefully, you'll notice that another actually dies in their place on the day that they sin. As something of a prophetic act, God sacrifices an animal. He clothes Adam and Eve in skins to cover over their shame. The shadow of the cross looms large in this story. This is the first death sentence recorded in the Bible, and more follow. The flood, where great evil is washed away. The fire, where Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. Korah, where the earth opens up to swallow him like a grave. Throughout all of the wisdom literature, the Psalms and the prophets, the repeated warning to the wicked who seemingly prosper right now, and the comfort to the righteous who are suffering and dying right now, is that God will eventually bring forth justice and he will deal with evildoers. And what do these texts say is their final fate? Whilst nowhere in the Old Testament is it mentioned tormented eternally in, a mort in an immortal body, there are some 70 plus metaphors that describe the final fate of the wicked as death. We are told that the wicked will wither like grass. They will be blown away like chaff. They will perish. They will be, they will vanish. We are told that God will cut them off. He will slay them. He will blot them out of the book of the living and he will rain down fire and brimstone upon them. This is hardly language depicting eternal conscious torment. Rereading the Old Testament with this grid led me to an awkward question. If death is not the penalty for sin, but rather eternal conscious torment in a body that cannot die is, then wouldn't it be strange, bordering on unethical, for the entire Old Testament to have no such warning. The one exception I held on to, at least initially, was Daniel 12 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth shall rise, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, I knew I'd heard this quoted by preachers I admired to destroy the credibility of any belief in the final annihilation of the wicked. See, they would say, Daniel says that the wicked will be raised to eternal shame and condemned. Case closed. But that's not what the text said. As I read conditionalist scholars, they pointed out the wicked are raised to shame. Yes, but that only the contempt is qualified by the adjective eternal or everlasting. Throughout the whole Old Testament, the only other place where the Hebrew word for contempt is used happens to be in a prophetic vision of the new heavens and the new earth in Isaiah chapter 66. Some of Isaiah's language here will no doubt be familiar to you from the lips of Jesus. 
describing the righteous from around the world who have just gathered to worship God in his glorious city, then going out, it says of them, and they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched, and they will be loathsome, contemptible to all mankind. Notice what's here. Dead bodies, the corpses of God's slain enemies, are feasted upon by worms, burned up by fire, neither of which can be stopped from doing their natural work, consumption. And notice who feels the contempt. It's not the wicked towards God, but the righteous towards the shameful memory of the wicked as they see their corpses being destroyed. Reading this, I came to see, so undying worms don't have to mean living people are being forever eaten alive. Unquenchable fire doesn't have to mean that living people are being forever burned alive. Eternal contempt isn't how the wicked are forever, uh, sorry, eternal thing is how the wicked are forever remembered after having been killed and not how they consciously feel for all eternity. As I continue to ask questions of conditionalists to test whether what they said was true against the scriptures, I came to see how much explanatory power their view had when it came to reconciling all the varied teaching around the final fate of the lost. First, the terror and shame of being resurrected to stand in final judgment, where of your evil is laid bare by God's justice in the sight of everyone. A second, the deep loss at the realization that you have forfeited the immortality and eternal life on offer through the gospel, that you miss out on the unimaginable joy of being with Jesus forever. Third, the conscious experience of suffering in hell as you were exposed to the holy fire of God's presence in the process of your death sentence being carried out. And finally, the extinction of evil as you succumb to the eternal and irrevocable second death, or as Jesus warned, your soul is extinguished and your body is destroyed. You see, I found myself jumping from verse to verse through the Gospels and the letters in the New Testament, looking for passages that clearly taught my traditional view, only to find with fresh eyes the conditionless logic of the Gospel seems strong. The contrast of the gift of eternal life to the saved with the punishment of eternal destruction for the lost. In Matthew 25, 46, Jesus says that the righteous will go away into eternal life, but the wicked will go away into eternal punishment. The logical contrast to life being death. And Paul says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Romans 6, 23. And John captures the beauty of Christ's gospel invitation in the most memorable verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. The more I tried to explain this vivid contrast with an appeal to spiritual life or spiritual death instead of bodily life or bodily death, I realized I was straining the consistent meaning of those words as used by each individual biblical author, that I was pushing the semantic range of other words beyond their natural limit, and that I was having to read between the lines to invent whole theological concepts that are nowhere explicitly taught in scripture. I guess I just started to see things that to me didn't make sense, that eternal conscious torment required that I believe death means living forever in hell. That eternal conscious torment required that I believe destroyed means living forever in hell. That eternal conscious torment required that I believe perishing means living forever in hell. And when you move away from the parables and images of Jesus to more explicit didactic teaching in the well, various biblical authors seem to set up Sodom and Gomorrah as the paradigm for how God will finally deal with evildoers, with complete destruction being the end result of coming under God's judgment as the consuming or eternal fire. Take Jesus' half-brother, Jude, Jude 7. He said, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Or in like manner, take 2 Peter 2.6. It said, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what he is going to do to the ungodly, burning them to ashes. Nearly every verse I once thought to teach eternal conscious torments ended up using standard principles for biblical exegesis being better explained in support of conditional immortality. The only two passages that I held out with 
for a good 12 months, I found in the book of Revelation. Revelation 14, 9 to 11, and Revelation 20, verse 10. The smoke that rises forever, the beast, the false prophet, and the devil being tormented alive forever and ever. When I took stock of where I was, that's when I realized I was in trouble. That if I took away the book of Revelation, I would be a conditionalist. And when your exegetical case hinges on reinterpreting scores of clear teaching from beginning to end in the Bible, through two verses from the most symbolic and enigmatic book in Scripture, the one that John needed an angel to interpret for him at points along the way because the symbols didn't make sense. That's when I think it could be seriously time to rethink your footing. Now, as soon as you treat Revelation as apocalyptic literature, as it is, as evocative symbols that are used to depict something very different in reality, and as soon as you realize that the lake of fire is actually divinely interpreted for us by that angel in Revelation 2014 as the second death, then even Revelation can be interpreted as a thoroughly conditionist, conditionalist book. Over the space of about 18 months, walking through every verse in the Bible, I became convinced that all of them, on careful inspection, ended up pointing more towards conditional immortality than my old view of eternal conscious torment. Now, I don't have time to go through an exegesis of any of these verses, let alone all of them. And making a comprehensive case for conditional immortality, that's not at all the point of tonight's lecture. But I wanted to give you a brief survey just so you can get a sense of the percussive force with which I went from my relatively firm convictions to be upended by the study of the very scriptures I thought used to clearly teach my view. To be honest, I found the whole experience really disorienting. To have taught something publicly, to have researched and defended something academically, to feel like you have a reasonably good grasp on it as the hell guy, only to find that you'd never done your due diligence to understand the case for the alternative, that was really humbling. I came to a right to decide whether to press forward and keep asking uncomfortable questions, questions I knew that could lead me down a difficult path, or whether to just retreat to the safety of historical orthodoxy and simply deny what I'd uncovered. But honestly, that's not much of a decision to make. I knew I was tentatively persuaded that conditional immortality made more sense, at least of the raw biblical data, but I also know there comes a point where you have to move beyond mere exegesis and start to piece everything together, systematic theology. And Christian doctrine, it's kind of like an interwoven history. If you start pulling at certain threads, that can have all kinds of unintended consequences. And you can even unravel the gospel itself. And so I had a third major question to explore in my own experience of theological triage, the question of theology. What effect does this doctrine have on the gospel. Now, I'm a gospel guy. I want to faithfully frame God and the gospel to an unbelieving world. And I want to continually remind the church of that which is of first importance upon what we have taken our stand. So I was curious to know whether adopting conditional immortality did any damage to the integrity of my theology. What I found, however, was that far from crumbling my foundations, Without even sparking me to make any more theological changes, the conditional immortality, it provided me with a wealth of theological clarity. I had never considered, for instance, that my traditional view required the belief that God sustains evil for all eternity, merely quarantining criminals in a cosmic prison in order to protect the holiness and harmony of the new creation. Does the eternal existence of evil sound right? I'd never considered that my traditional view meant that God's justice would never be satisfied, as the punishing of the lost with conscious suffering would be ongoing forever, if that is the penalty that sin required. So does the eternal of God sound right? I'd never considered that my traditional view made the physical death of Jesus redundant for the atonement. For if the punishment of hell is eternal conscious suffering in an immortal cannot die, then Jesus could have just achieved our atonement in his bodily suffering on the cross, get down after to tell us die without ever having to die physically. But none of this seemed right. But conditional immortality allowed me to emphatically affirm so many of these other doctrines that I already believed in biblical teaching that in various ways, my traditional view had unconsciously undermined. And I found that fascinating. Now, the hell conversation brings up challenging theological questions that still need to be hashed out. 
particularly around the nature of the atonement. This is both for traditionalists and conditionalists. If anyone here is looking for a master's project or PhD, there is some fruitful room for study there. But on the whole, I found no serious theological chink in the conditionalist armor. At least none that didn't also reveal a sizable counter challenge for the traditionalist view as well. We've got some work to do. Conditional immortality just seemed to fit so well with the Bible, as well as with my grasp of the rest of Orthodox theology. And so around the end of 2017, I shifted adopting conditional immortality. But even though I believed it was the truth taught in scripture, and even though I believed it was theologically fruitful for the harmony of other doctrines, I wasn't convinced that the broader church, many of whom still believed that the traditional view was a shibboleth for evangelicalism, I didn't think that they would be well served by me speaking openly. Because what was the impetus? You see, in my mind, conditionalism was actually too like traditionalism to actually warrant making any noise. Both believe that hell is God's retributive just sin. Both believe in the finality of hell as a place to which you're sent. Both believe that hell's punishment is eternal. The only difference is on the nature of that punishment, whether it's eternal conscious suffering or temporary suffering leading to internal death. So at the time, I just didn't see anything to be gained. So now you know why I changed my mind about hell. I was persuaded by scripture that conditional immortality better explain the whole counsel of God on the final fate of the wicked. But let me close by considering the impact of this doctrine and use our final grid question in theological triage to explain why I'm now going public with changing my mind about hell. This is the question of culture. What effect does this doctrine have on the church? I cannot imagine holding to any doctrine of hell without tears. The thought that those, outside Christ will be lost for all eternity. That should be too much for us to bear. To hold at the forefront of our conscious mind for long is a heavy thing. But that is the truth of the scriptures. When Jesus looked out over an unbelieving Jerusalem, a people who refused to come to him to have life, we're told that he wept. How much more when he looks out over an unbelieving world must he weep? And we should too. The reality of hell, whether you are a conditionalist or a traditionalist, it should drive us to our knees in prayer. It should quicken our desire to share Christ in the gospel through which he has brought life and immortality to light. Now, I've had people say to me that they are wary of conditional immortality because they believe it will stifle the church's evangelistic zeal. But I just don't feel that, and I just don't see it. One of the greatest evangelists I have ever known was Michael Green. If you're an evangelical in England, you would know his name a former rector of St. Aldate's in Oxford, a professor of Regents College in Canada. For decades on end, even well into his 80s, this tiny diminutive man joins students around the country for evangelistic missions on university campuses. He was known to sleep on concrete floors, talk to students outside in the blistering cold, and preach compassionate fire in every lunchtime talk. This old man was animated with an unusual spiritual energy to see young people snatched from the fire of hell and receive Christ. And as one of the UK's most influential evangelists, no one could accuse this conditionalist of having his doctrine of hell dampen his evangelism. So that critique of conditional immortality, that it will dull the church's evangelistic fervor, it just never made sense to me as a reason for remaining silent in the hell debate. Where I have tended to notice a difference in evangelism, though, between the two views is in the focus of the preaching. Whereas modern preachers rarely mention hell in their sermons, perhaps out of an awkwardness or an inability to helpfully articulate the traditional view for the modern world, conditional immortality actually leans into a natural fear of death that's experienced by all people everywhere. Rather than focusing in on the gory details of what is endured in hell's endless torments, like Dante or Milton or Edwards or Tetzel, Instead, conditionalists tend to focus in on what is lost in having your life snuffed out. 
namely the unceasing joy of eternal life with Christ. It is the glory of Jesus Christ. It is the paradise of being in his presence. That's what takes pre precedence in conditionalist preaching about hell. It's beautiful. But still, this slight adjustment, even in my own preaching, is something I could have easily made privately. So why am I going public? Well, over the last few years, I've become aware of literally dozens of godly people all over Australia and around the world who hold to conditional immortality, but who do so secretly, because to go public would come at a huge cost. I could name names here that would shock you. Pastors who would be blacklisted from their denominations, lecturers who would be asked to leave their colleges, Christians who would be removed from fellowship within their churches. For their sake and for the church's sake, I want to see that change. Given that conditional immortality is represented in the earliest fathers, that it can be affirmed alongside the creeds, that it was never condemned by the councils, why make the traditional view on hell a theological shibboleth for evangelicalism? Given that the case for conditional immortality is made from a rigorous exegesis of the whole counsel of God and is held by serious evangelical scholars, ones who have a high view of scripture and whose commentaries fill your shelves and mine, why make the traditional view on hell a theological shibboleth for evangelicalism? Given that conditional immortality brings theological clarity to a host of other doctrines and does nothing as far as I can see to undermine the gospel message or our zealous motivation for sharing it, why make the traditional view on hell a shibboleth for evangelicalism? I just don't see the impetus in doing theological triage to draw a fault line that excludes conditionalists. And having been a front row seat to that kind of pain myself, I don't want to see brothers in the world pay an unnecessary price for following their theological conscience. God's judgment, that is a first order doctrine. The finality and eternality and justice of his punishment. But whether the nature of that punishment is conscious suffering or death, I just don't think it rates up there. Division on this issue seems too costly for no gain. And so in my ministry questioning Christianity, the board and I, we have no official. We chose to adopt the guiding documents of Lausanne, the Lausanne Covenant, as our theological basis. I'm a conditionalist. I plan on hiring traditionalists. And the only condition is that their theological conscience is shaped by scripture and is whole, held in a way that serves the church healthily, working together for the advance of the gospel. I actually want to strive to lead that vision of table fellowship. But there is another reason I want to see conditional immortality become a live theological option. And this one's actually closer to my heart in evangelism. Last year when the pandemic hit, a young man approached me online to see if we could talk. This happens relatively often because of the online content. Now, he had grown up in a Christian home, but as a teenager with questions that no one in his church was answering, he'd walked away from Christ. And now, as a young adult, he was still asking questions, but from the outside. And so, at the start of COVID, we caught up for a walk in the park, appropriately distanced, of course. And as we talked, he kept raising various moral concerns about God. And as an apologist, I knew the precarious nature of borrowing some moral standard in order to try and disprove or beat God with it, but it wasn't the right time to go on some offensive. I listened. I gently asked probing questions. And when it came down to it, nearly all of his questions at bottom were really about the justice of hell and what that said to him about the character of God. Now, he couldn't fathom how unending conscious torment was a just punishment or how a loving God could delight in the anguish, anguish of the lost for all eternity. That picture of God, he said, was just so far away from what he saw in Jesus. And it was even so far away from the beauty of God's character described as the substance of his glory when he passed by Moses on Mount Sinai. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. So I explained to him the doctrine of conditional immortality. And I asked hypothetically, if that were true, would that change your mind about God? Unflinchingly and honestly, he said, absolutely, if that's what the Bible teaches. Recently, a young mom at a church play group my kids go to, someone who's grown up in an incredibly conservative church tradition, she asked me about my view on hell. And I cautiously explained it to her, fully expecting a negative reaction. She just smiled at me and said, that sounds a lot more like God. 
On every survey about the belief blockers that secular people have towards the gospel, the traditional view of hell always rates in the top five. When you start trawling through the growing number of deconversion and deconstruction stories online from people who grew up in the church, the traditional view of hell is a constant feature in people walking away from Christianity. And when you do as many public Q&As in Christian circles as I have, you get a sense of really how many Christians actually struggle with deep doubts in trying to reconcile their belief in the traditional view of hell with the God they see revealed in Jesus and his teaching in the New Testament. Now, when I was a traditionalist, I actually had responses to all of these questions, whether it's Anselm's justification for sinning against an infinite God warranting an eternal conscious punishment, to C.S. Lewis's argument that punishment continues uh, in hell because sin continues in hell. It's possible to defend the traditional view against these attacks. If that is what the Bible taught, I would defend God's justice and goodness in the face of those critiques. They're not insurmountable. Ah, serious hurdles that keep all kinds of people, Christian and otherwise, from being able to entrust themselves and their loved ones into God's hands. Now, I guess as much as I want to extend a plea for theological peace across the table on this issue, opening up conditional immortality is a live option for belief amongst evangelicals. I also want to start asking my traditionalist brothers and sisters to consider, to really consider whether what they believe makes the most sense of scripture. Why? Because what if defending traditionalism is actually the wrong fight for us? What if eternal conscious torment is not just a harmless misstep in the history of theological tradition, but it's a destructive liability to the health of the church and to the advance of the gospel? What if we are turning away those whom God loves by framing God and the gospel wrong? Now, I realize that these can sound like incendiary questions. I don't raise them lightly, and they're not at all intend to put anyone on the defensive. I just want to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to see those he loves embrace repentance and eternal life through the cross. And my fear is only that we misrepresent God to those whom he loves, muddying the motivational waters as we extend our gospel invitation. Now, I could be wrong. Knowing me, I probably am. But I wanted to start a public conversation so that we can figure that out together humbly confessing that my arrogance stopped me from doing so way back in 2011. My tone was wrong, and my theology has been wrong. I was wrong either then or I'm wrong now. I'm not sure which, but I've definitely been wrong at some point. So on this issue, I just hope we can all be a little bit more Christ-like in how we do theological triage together. You have a role to play in this conversation. Whether for you tonight, it might just be the impetus to do your own personal deep dive, taking some serious time to consider God's word from all sides and challenging your incumbent position in order that by the Holy Spirit, God might form in you your own theological conscience on this issue. Take the time. Perhaps your role is to help shape a healthier conversation within your own circles more broadly, not jumping in quick to smack down your brothers and sisters in Christ who hold a different position to the one that you do. And maybe, just maybe, by God's grace, if it turns out that I am wrong, that I have strayed, whether in truth or in my time, you might be the one that God wants to use to change my mind on hell once again. Thanks for giving me a hearing. The Lord bless you and keep you. I look forward to taking the questions in just a few minutes. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, it's, it's clear to all of us that you're not just here talking about ideas. You haven't just read some books and collated some thoughts and sharing stuff that is impersonal to you. It clearly means a lot to you and you've shared out of your experience deeply. And I think we're all really grateful for that. Yeah. Um, we have some time now for some Q&A. Wow, you're just right on time, man. You've done this before. Um, I think Dan's got 13 talks in the next week of two weeks he's, he speaks a lot this guy um he talks he get fit a lot of words in too didn't he eternal conscious torment eternal conscious torment. What, are you trying to get my attention oh should i step forward you don't like the halo i like the halo <laughs> it was intentional um i'm by the way what i'm doing right now is buying you time to think <laughs> of your question so are there any questions um i'll keep this ipad handy because we may have some questions coming in here as well. Um, one, one question that I did see come in uh, on the chat there was, 
Did you have a, a singular aha moment in your shifting of views or was it quite gradual? Uh, it was definitely quite gradual. Uh, I think because I, as you shared, I'm usually quite busy. Uh, I don't have oodles of time to sit around going through every verse in the Bible for every particular doctrine. And so I'd keep picking it up here or there. I'd pick up something, I'd read an article, I'd read a book, I'd look at a verse, I'd go and look at different interpretations of it. And you kind of ruminate on that for a while and then you'd go away. Mm. Uh, I do think realizing how much the Old Testament prophetic use of the language in the New Testament actually helped solidify my move towards conditional immortality. Mm. Uh, to realize that the way in which I'd heard undying worms, unquenchable fire, weeping and gnashing of teeth to um, absolutely imply the eternal conscious torment view and then read its original context when mm. something seemingly Gehenna? very different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, for, yeah, for those who didn't even go there, but um, Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom, uh, just the southwest of Jerusalem, it was in the Old Testament condemned um, as a place by the prophet where people had done child sacrifice to Moloch. And so God said it was unfit for his worship and it became this uh, cursed place mm. that was meant to be a sort of fruitless picture. But by the time of Jesus, it was kind of synonymous with the place where God would bring final judgment down upon people. Isaiah 66 passage, um, the concept of going out from the city and being able to see the after mm. effects of, of it. Uh, so yeah, And it yeah. was a place, uh, a con uh, eternally burning rubbish heap where well, the actually, fire literally didn't come so, out very so much. So these are it? some of the myths that I had to pop along the okay. way. So that did was, you pop that one? I did. So, well, oh. I didn't, but I had it popped. Thanks very much. So, the first, the first I've been enjoying that, that one for years. Concept. I know. Again, it's the Simpsons with the eternally burning the tire yard. Uh, but I mean, that, that jumps into our traditions only in sort of the 12th century with a, with a Jewish reference. Uh, there's nothing prior in terms of history with that. And so for us, it's not considered to be well established, evidentially, that they were using it as some kind of dumping ground or eternally burning kind of place. Right. Uh, the fire imagery, I think, in the New Testament really links back towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. the consistent use of fire throughout the old testament and certainly matthew's teaching matthew 3 8 13 18 all the way through to matthew 25 just keeps setting up this picture of it, it burning up rather than continuing to burn mm. uh, so yeah dif differences there those sorts of things yeah. were like interesting you'd heard them preach and then when you look at what is the warrant for holding on to that idea often came up you could do like a myth busters yeah. just all eight, about hell eight myths about hell that, yeah that we got wrong but uh but you I should mean, have had an image of Hellboy up here yeah at some point totally. that, i would have enjoyed that um i have one other question just while i'm buying more time for people um the question one question that came to my mind as you talked about the opposite of eternal conscious torment not being well death being the opposite as opposed to um well no sorry the opposite of um eternal life yeah. not being eternal conscious torment but being death mm. and you mentioned a few old testament uh stories you know starting with genesis and uh, genesis 3 yep. uh the skin that god clothed adam and eve with and then the flood and so on there's always death um i just wondered if you could say a few words about sheol because i no doubt you would have looked into that totally. in some depth and for those of you who were wondering what dan meant when he said there's no hell in the old testament so the old testament talks more about a place called sheol which is sort of understood as a um, an underworld or a place where maybe souls go after death or it's a an after death place um and i guess there's the argument could be made that that stands against a view like the one the condition of, of death and totally. finality yeah yeah i think it's a great question to bring up uh so um, sh actually i'd encourage you to come get my paper off me my original master's thesis so as much as i don't agree with some of the conclusions there's some really good scholarship in there too uh <laughs> and so one thing i did was walk through the old testament what does the old testament say about life after death and then mm. what does it say about life after life after death or post-resurrection life um, and these are really kind of important concepts. Uh, and the Old Testament uses a uh, term Sheol uh, in the LXX or the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That's where we get Hades. It translates Hades in there. Most of New Testament around the afterlife stuff actually talks about Hades, the parable of the rich man Lazarus in Luke 16. That's about Hades. Uh, so it's often described in Christian theology as what we would say the intermediate state. Uh, what happens to you when you die, but before the general resurrection and final judgment? And so uh, amongst Jewish thinkers, there's differences of opinion. The vast majority of the Old Testament where you use a Sheol, it's in poetic uh, sort of um, places that it's describing a lot, particularly in the Psalms, but it's usually considered either just the grave 
the place where literally you're buried underground. But there are some verses, particularly in Job and in the prophets, which intimate maybe more of a shadowy existence. And certainly where you've got the experience where uh, Saul goes to the witch of Endor to be able to get Saul's, uh, Samuel. um, Samuel's spirit to be able to come up and give him counsel. Uh, you're like, what is going on here? Love that uh, story. Yeah, it's sort of one of those kind of stories that's in there but it's there and uh so it seems to imply that there is some kind of post-death experience now are we conscious then are we asleep then these are questions that the old testament doesn't really give all that much info in the new testament certainly speaks more it seems to intimate some kind of intermediate state you, your body goes into the ground an immaterial part of you maybe consciousness in hades or in uh, Abraham's bosom before the resurrection of Jesus and then in the third heaven where Jesus is there I also shall be after his resurrection and ascension leading captive the, um, in his train and so um, yes uh, what I would say is I actually don't think that an intermediate state has all that much to do with the final state precisely because Jesus describes that there is a distinct difference between the first and second death he said fear not him who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna in hell so the distinction between a first and a second death is made by Jesus explicitly in Matthew 10, 28. So I think the intermediate state's interesting, but even conditionalists disagree wildly on the intermediate state. Some don't believe there is one, soul sleep or physicalists. I'm a dualist. I do believe there is one, but I think it's different to the, the final. Uh, the, the, I couldn't resist. Good one. I'm going to put up, I'm going to put up a fence right here. I'm going to do some fencing. Uh, Your response there was beautiful. Um, Good one. You know, that's, yeah, that's, that's basically what my wife gives to me all the yeah. time. <laughs> well, I've got two new jokes from tonight. There's right. the eternal, eternal punishment, punishment. Yeah. and even jellyfish. Yeah. Oh, come on. No spine. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm making light of no, no, that's quite totally, serious. That's totally fine. So, yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't say that the existence of the intermediate state bears much at all upon the eternal. Mm. I think what is necessary is that there is going to be a final judgment where God can make sure that justice is done and that's done in the vision of all that there has to be a way in which he preserves people so that in their resurrection, they are that same person. Right. So one of the reasons why I, as a dualist, hold to substance dualism, the idea that there is an immaterial part that survives death, the first death at least, is the problem of identity. Mm. That it really has to be me that is resurrected to stand judgment and not just a clone of me that God brings back into being into the future. And so he preserves our spirit or our soul through the first death in order that we can stand final judgment. Mm. And then those who are cast into hell are finally killed with the second death which is more intensive than the first that actually extinguishes your soul as well yeah that's that's great one of the things that um i guess a, a terrible, core, a core, yeah saying, sorry it's not it's great just helping it's, to explain the view. and this is actually a big yeah. part for me was actually taking the time to figure out what is it they really think because you hear annihilation you think oh they die and then they're gone and that's not at all the view right mm. um so it's helping to parse out what is it that evangelical conditionalists actually believe before i jump to all of my verses to try and disprove it and so i found mm. myself just asking it but what about but what about for that whole 18 month period mm. yeah. yeah and still yeah one of the when you talked about theology and the importance of piecing all of the scriptures together and having a cohesive yeah. view of all of this i found tom wright to be super helpful on this and and his um his thinking and i would say you know he he well he says himself that this is not the way it is but people often ask him so what's heaven going to be like mm -hmm. and of course everyone wants to know the the answer to that question and he says look i'm postulating well he, i'm postulating in his lovely deep english voice but he he talks about consistency god has never given up on anything ever like god is a god who redeems that simply means god restores with purpose and with a sense of direction and so for god to suddenly do that at the end uh, when he's never, it's never been in God's character to give up on things. It's, it does seem odd. Um, well, I think these, these are probably the two biggest impulses that lead people down the universalist line. Yeah. So there's that kind of picture of the ever pursuing love of God, sort of where David Bentley Hart begins. Mm -hmm. And then those parts of the Bible, there's four passages in particular in the New Testament that speak of the summing up of all things in Christ. And this was that apocatastasis doctrine that Origen held the idea that in the end, God will be all in all, or he is reconciling all things to himself, or that every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So those are sort of the, the two poles that hold up the universalist line. And my, my challenge with those intimations is that it certainly seems to fly in the face of much clearer teaching, which speaks about the finality of judgment. Mm -hmm. And that there comes a time where because of the unwillingness of people to repent, God seems to step in and just say enough that I'm not going to allow evil to corrupt my good world forever. 
I'm not going to allow you to pervert yourself or harm others. Mm. And ultimately not to that picture of, of uh, and this is actually the biggest thesis uh, chapter in my thesis was exploring exactly this. How is it possible that uh, people lock the doors of hell from the inside forever? Not that they're being held there against their will, but they are unwilling mm. to receive Christ and repent and exploring sort of an anthropological picture on how that makes sense. So I know that's a lot of word soup if you're new to this, but it could be an interesting one, um, mm. sort of chapter five in my thesis. So you didn't say as much about the universalist position. I guess it, it was for you yeah. a move from the other, one, one of the other two, one of the other positions to the, the third one. I'm really getting my words out, aren't I? Um, I'm having a bit of anthropological soup myself right now. But what would you say to someone who does hold that position, the universalist position, maybe because of uh, reasons that I mentioned earlier about God's character being one of redemption and always seeing a way forward or some such thing? Um, is there anything that you would say in particular about that view that yeah, might help I mean, someone? Let's who's... go through those similar questions that mm -hmm. we looked okay. at. You yeah. know, I think it's always a, help, it was a helpful grid. You know? mm. uh, on the historical question, certainly the church has had a much bigger problem with that. Mm. Um, and again, the church can be wrong, so it's not a final authority, but at mm -hmm. least something here where there's been a real concern that it seems to be giving up something central, particularly a, a kind of view of the scriptures in particular. I think the second one really is then the Bible. Can you make sense of every verse within the Bible, or do you just decide to ignore passages that don't fit your model or downplay them as unimportant? I really, and this is what's the thing for me, I wanted a thoroughly consistent approach to making sense of every verse. And so that's why for me, when I say, actually, I think even Revelation is a thoroughly con conditionalist book when you look at how death is defined from chapter two onwards, that made, made sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so the scripture would be a, a challenging one. The theological one, this is where, uh, uh, I think there's some merit to the universalist position when you talk about the savior of everyone, especially those who believe, you know, uh, or um, the save, um, about the summing up of all things. You don't have to think that the summing up of all things involve some in glory and some in subjection. You can actually say that that's a willing kind of place. So there's some pluses, but then there's some huge minuses mm -hmm. as well in sort of making sense of uh, your, your approach to scripture. When it comes the to, the one, details. to the details. Yeah. Uh, but the big one is kind of the impact that that, that kind of has. Uh, on the mission and ministry and gospel of the church. Uh, it seems to be that the clear biblical client of Jesus is eternal life or perishing. It's at the very center of his own invitation to Nicodemus. It's the very center of the gospel preaching is he's coming to judge eternal life only for those who believe. Mm. I don't think a warning makes sense in a, a warning of final judgment makes sense if the end result is that everyone ultimately is going to be saved. I think it would be, hey, you can have a better life now if you follow God's purpose in your life, mm. but don't worry eventually. Yeah. Maybe hot for a while, but you'll figure it out. You yeah. know, uh, I think the warning passages certainly don't seem to fit that similar grid, and certainly that evangelistic impulse amongst universalists it, 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 is less. We can have a conversation around that. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, I don't want to do any anecdotal or um, sort of hominem attacks against people, but no, um, no, fair enough. I don't know many high-profile universalist evangelists. There was one. Interesting. Farewell, Rob Bell. Ah, yes. Right. Um, any, any other questions from the floor tonight? Yeah, go ahead, Mandy. Um, oh, I was, I've always wondered, I don't remember actually seeing anything in scripture that specifically says at, at this particular time, God will make that final decision about everybody's standing and that is the end of their opportunity to ever make a change that's what we've been taught but i don't remember any passages that actually say that so the universalist thing may be an ongoing opportunity going forward even after the end of the world as we know it all do you know what i'm saying yeah I totally know what you say and it is an interesting one about uh like there's certain passages that you say i wish the bible was more clear in some of these some of these things and i'm a bit like nt right there are points where i simply feign and say there are points we don't know we're leaning into mystery. I think the ultimate decision on the end, um, uh, new heavens, new earth, as well as being cast into hell, there is not a whole lot of the details. And the reason being, because he doesn't want the choice to either be paradise or suffering or death. He wants the choice between me or not me. Like that's the substance of the decision. Do you want to be with God for eternity or not? And the reasons for which people reject God, uh, you know, are really hard for us to tap into. But when it comes to the finality aspect, there are certainly some that people would say lean in that direction. You know, the whole... Uh, Hebrews 10, 27, if it's appointed for a man once to die and then to face judgment. And what is the point of judgment? 
at what is happening at this judgment. Uh, what is the purpose of hell? What is, uh, if these things are ultimately people can just have opportunity and change their mind down the track? Is that something that hell would actually engender? Um, so one of the interesting things about the Eastern Orthodox view of hell is not that it is an absence from God, but it's the presence of God. I actually lean towards this way myself, that it's being exposed to the holy presence of God in your sinful state. It's the warning throughout the Old Testament. No one can look upon God in their sinful flesh and live from Exodus 33, 20. That's the warning that God gives to Moses. Uh, and, you know, he dwells in unapproachable light. Or our God is a consuming fire in Hebrews 10. So this kind of language that I, I think being exposed to God in a sinful state doesn't have the end result of wooing you back to him. It actually hardens you against him. And I think this is what you see with Pharaoh being having God come and reveal through Moses. He hardens his heart in response to that. He doesn't soften it. And the dynamics of why and how I think are mysterious, and I, I can't answer that. But I would say for me, the idea of, that there is a judgment in itself and a place to which you're sent, even in the, the parable, that's the warning for the rich man, the, the fixedness of that chasm. And you don't want to interpret every point in a parable, but no one can cross from here to there. If it was intended to lay out hope, I think the New Testament has done a bad job um, in that regard. Um, but I, you know, I, I think each has to form their own theological conscience and being able to work through that. Yeah. Got a couple more questions. Do you mind if I go to a student before lecture? Um, I'll just I'll bring this over to you, Dylan, just so that the folks online can hear you. Great. Thank you very much. Hey, mate. Oh, so this doesn't just, work. I still talk about. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, first of all, I, I want to say thanks so much. I think it's such a, a bold uh, thing to be able to stand up and share these deep convictions and a deep journey. And I can relate coming from a similar journey myself. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to hear. I'm very encouraging. And I pray Appreciate that, that Thank God you. continues to bless you with that. The one thing I, I want to push back, though, as I, as I hear some of your positions, is I fear that, like in some of the things you just said before, I want to see a consistent idea throughout Scripture that it's always there. And I wonder if sometimes evangelicals have to push this notion that when Scripture speaks on a topic like the Messiah, like God, like hell, it always has to be talking about the same thing. Whereas I would push back and say quite often, instead of taking this systematic uh, theology approach, but a, a biblical sort of approach in saying that, uh, throughout scripture, you get different, um, or the prophets function as like inspired signs pointing into this mist. Um, they don't tell you exactly what it's going to look like, but they give you some sort of direction. And so often you see the, the prophets giving different signs pointing into the same thing. And so I don't think you have to sort of make them all, bend them all to say to the same sort of thing about hell or death or the underworld, or actually think it's you can have inspired authors speaking about different things from different angles, developing the doctrine of the underworld or death over time, uh, pre-exilic, post-exilic, they all influence yeah. and change things again. Yeah, I definitely think that's fair. Like, um, and I would, I would agree with a lot of the things that you just shared in terms of the concepts of progressive revelation, in terms of the themes in biblical theology, in terms of unique emphases of different authors. I, uh, again, my thesis does a lot of kind of laying out what those are and the different emphases of John, you know, death and life and light and darkness versus Paul is very much fire and destruction versus Jesus is very parabolic in uh, almost all of his teaching about the end, but it's very, very gather them up, burn the weeds, burn the weeds, burn the weeds, burn the weeds, burn the weeds. Uh, so that's kind of the, the consistent sort of themes as you kind of wander through. And, and so I, I do think there can be differences in emphases through there. I would find it strange, though, if God was trying to communicate something of such high value. Uh, particularly where are you going to spend all eternity? Um, and this is my, my problem with the progressive revelation argument. Like when it comes to the Trinity, I'm there, you know? Uh, I think there are seeds in the Old Testament. Uh, it's only something that's made clear in the New Testament. And so I'm, I'm fine with that for the Trinity, but no one is uh, denying the oneness of God. They're just adding to that oneness threeness. Whereas if when you've got an entire Old Testament that is... Uh, saying that death is the punishment for sin. And then all of a sudden you jump to the New Testament and you're saying, actually, all those guys who were just worried that they'd die and that would be it. Punk, it's, uh, it's actually eternal conscious torment. You know, uh, it's, it's a pretty different thing. And I don't actually hang much on that argument. I just think it's something. Uh, if you were to wanting to warn kids, hey, what could happen? Like my kid's about to jump off an edge into a 
pit of knives. And I'm like, hey, buddy, it could hurt a little bit, you know? It's like, no, you need to understand the seriousness of what could go down. So I'm trying to relay these sorts of warnings. And it's interesting to me that just death is the consistent message right throughout the Old Testament. So, but yeah, I, I understand what you mean in terms of the need to force every detail to a filter so that they're all univocal. I, I agree. Yeah, appreciate that. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I was really interested in the way you unpacked the idea of everlasting contempt and how that's kind of actually uh, felt by the righteous. Mm. And um, how, what does that mean for the experience of the righteous? Mm. I mean, it, everlasting contempt doesn't yeah. seem to gel with kind of everlasting life yeah and again it's it's i mean it's how we feed our english word contempt back into it right so it's a translation question here but i think it's the concept of feeling that right justice is done justice is served it's a feeling of a hatred of evil right this is wrong that this is painful it's harmful and one of the interesting things about the, the new world is not that it goes back to the innocence of the first world We've actually passed through the first world to know the pain and then the beauty of redemption. The scars aren't gone off Jesus in his resurrection body. He still bears that cost. We understand what our evil cost him for all eternity. And I just think there's something there. It's actually one of the reasons why I think even if uh, with freedom in the new heavens and the new earth, we're not going to fall into a, if we still have freedom because freedom is necessary for love to exist and for meaningful existence, does that mean that we're going to have the fall 2.0? You know, one of the things stopping that is, I think now we understand the full weight of our evil, of not trusting in the goodness of God. And we've seen the depth of God's love displayed at the cross. And so that same temptation to doubt that God really loves us and has that good at heart is just not something that's going to be present in that same way. So I think that part of what that is, is a recognition of evil is evil. We, we've tasted of it. We've seen it. And at the judgment, when everything is made clear, we have the right feeling towards evil. It doesn't mean that we're, we rejoice over the death of people. It just means we rejoice over the end of evil. We remember the, the evil aspect with contempt, whatever. Hebrew just as we, as we come near the end, um, and I'm cutting you off there, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'd like to just push past maybe beneath hell. Um, that was terrible. Um, to ask. There's nothing there. <laughs> no, there's, there's no, <laughs> oh dear, it wasn't even a... <laughs> You're trying to get to the core of the question. <laughs> that's that's probably better. Um, I guess what I'm wondering, I, I really like that you've also raised a larger issue around theological diversity here. And that, yes, hell is almost an exemplar. It's one of the things that we have sometimes fought over, judged people over, uh, divided over. Um, but dare I ask, are there other issues that you are thinking through um, at the moment or have thought through that have also been those issues that have some grayness in Christian doctrine, uh, where an openness to theological diversity would be a great thing for us to learn to bring to the table. If you were talking about QC, Christ questioning Christianity, and I invite you to look into questioning Christianity because it's something that Dan has started fairly recently, and it's a pretty exciting um, venture. But one of the things you mentioned there was you would love to have the possibility of gathering people with different perspectives and working together and bringing those conversations into an open space. And that is something that we're afraid to do. We, you, you confess to sort of keeping something secret um, for some time. And I imagine in this room, there are a whole range of issues represented here that people think, I'm doubting this, I'm rethinking this, but I daren't tell anyone. Um, what are some of the, what is, or well, maybe one or two issues that you might be, if you, if you don't mind sharing, thinking about in that same Yeah, way? it's a really good question. Thanks, Paul. Um, <laughs> so it's, let, me, let me say a couple of things about the idea of doing that. Sure. Uh, I wouldn't talk publicly about everything just because you can't trust other people's reactions. Um, if you want to have helpful conversations, find good, trusted, generous-minded theological thinkers who will push back on you because they care about you and will ask good, healthy questions, but for your sake, not to beat you down or uh, something like that. So just make sure I think find a healthy place to have that conversation, create and create a good space for it. Um, as for the, the topics, I think they're varied. Uh, one of the things that Gavin's book is really trying to help you do is realize that there are kind of four tiers of different Christian ideas. There are the ones that really are the substance of our gospel message, that if they're not there, then we're not distinctively Christian in any way. You've given up on the gospel, that which is of first importance. There are other ones that shape how you do ministry that uh, you probably want church leaders to agree on 
you know, uh, whether or not uh, when um, uh, you've got a female ordinance, are they going to be an elder in your church? That's a big one. Uniting church says yes, almost univocally. Other churches say no, like Presbyterian church says no, almost univocally. So uh, that, that's a, that shapes how a denomination, how a church functions, and you kind of need to have broad agreement around that. Uh, and then there are other ones which people love talking about, which actually don't have all that much practical impact. Um, I think the ones that are really difficult to have conversations with are actually those second, those second tier ones, um, because often your sense of identity is wrapped up in it, your hopes for ministry is wrapped up in it. Uh, and so some of, the, some of the, the big ones that tend to go around the place uh, would certainly be sexuality. Um, that's one that I think the church at large is trying to make sense of. Uh, and I, I have a view on that. I've represented it publicly. All my videos are online. Uh, and it's probably going to get me into trouble at some point. Um, but uh, we'll have you back next year to speak well, about that. We've got, we've got to do the Bible one, the Bible one first. Um, but but I hold reasonably conservative views on those, but but relatively compassionately. And so I think um, I think the church needs to learn how to have that conversation better because we're talking past yeah. each other more than actually talking to each other. And, yeah. and it should be a shoulder to shoulder in the scriptures for the glory of God. Yeah. How is it that we we be God's people better in that way? Uh, I think the other the other ones that I always get asked about if I'm doing a and a in a Christian environment, it's always the, but Romans chapter nine says, and so you're all laughing because, you know, it's the sort of free will sovereignty stuff. Um, this is not going to go away because it continues to affect our picture of what is God like. And all of the biggest questions that I find the biggest controversy is usually this, uh, on the, the God question. It's not the technical science and faith. It's not the nitty gritty doctrine. It's not even the historical stuff. It really is around the, what, what is God, God like? Yeah. What is God like? And because we have such passionate views of wanting to frame him rightly and honor that picture to others, that's where the heat rather than light kind of yeah. elements in a conversation tend to come out. And I would just try and say as best as you're able in defending God, you defend him best by the tone in which you carry yourself and not just the content of your speech. Absolutely. And so if you want to share Christian truth, try and do it with a Christian tone. And if you're rethinking those areas, um, please don't just listen to one side of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, it's the easiest way to think yourself right is you surround yourself with people that think like you rather than actually being challenged by people who are wise and godly and intelligent who have a different perspective and at least having to test your arguments and ideas out against them is a healthy thing for you. Great. Thank you, Dan. Some real wisdom there. Could we just thank Dan once more? Well, I want to thank you for being with us tonight, for taking this Thursday night out from whatever else you might have been doing, uh, and really, hopefully, enriching your mind and enriching your relationships and your heart. Um, as a Christian uh, college, I'm just going to pray in closing. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, just sort of stare at that pillar there for a moment. But I do want to honor God in and God's presence. Um, as Christians, we do believe that God has been at work tonight in people's minds and hearts, whether you're online or whether you're here in the room. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for Dan. Thank you for his life experience that he has opened up and shared with us with some vulnerability tonight. I just pray for each person who has listened to this talk tonight, uh, whether online or here in the room, and we invite you, Holy Spirit of God, to keep working in our lives uh, to keep working in our minds and enabling us to do what Dan was just talking about, to represent you in the ways that we talk, in the ways that we think and speak and behave before we get to deciding what's black and white and what's right and what's wrong. So we ask that you would go with us now in peace. In Jesus' name, amen.